With this session update, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka and Senate Judiciary Chair Warren Limmer spoke with the Capitol Press Corps during a break about the omnibus judiciary and public safety finance and policy bill. Here's what they had to say. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I've got my glasses on because I'm going to read you lists of things we did and things we didn't do, and I wanted to be accurate. And Senator Limmer is here for all the details. He was the uh, the, the chief uh, negotiator on the Senate side for the bill that we have. Uh, but as we begin and talk about it, I, I just want to say that this particular bill, first and foremost, is about funding the courts, funding the, our, our police officers and the work that they do, and funding corrections. That was what this bill was supposed to be about, but obviously it became much, much more than that uh, when people talked about the, the police accountability measures that they wanted to do. And as we set out, we said we're not going to do any anti-police uh, provisions in this bill, and I think we we're successful at that. And we also didn't want to take any of the tools away that our police need as far as when they're trying to keep the streets safe. Uh, this should be about the public. It should be about the victims and, and what are we doing about them more than it should be about anything else. And so as we move forward, there are a number of things that, that we didn't get done, and I want to talk about those first because you heard uh, Democrat legislators complain about the things that weren't in the bill, and I thought you should know that there are some things that we also gave up. Uh, we thought that there, there should be more time for law enforcement to enact and train changes passed last summer regarding the use of deadly force. Uh, as you're aware, uh, we've had a hard time uh, getting mutual aid agreements with other states because of that language. That's how complicated it was and they asked for a little more time to make sure that they got up to speed. Uh, we were not able to get that passed. We wa wanted to improve the hiring practices for non-peace officers at law enforcement agencies, making sure background checks are happening for all staff in law enforcement agencies. This was important because many administrative or support staff have access to highly sensitive information. So we thought that would be pro appropriate that we got that language. We thought that doxing of law, law enforcement officers jeopardized law enforcement and their families. Uh, be, being able to post online where they live, we just thought that that should be changed. We didn't get that. We thought a pilot project to research and develop roadside tests for drug impairment was important. So if, if police officers pulled somebody over, they were clearly impaired, but it wasn't alcohol. We wanted to get more uh, ways to, to, to test that, and we didn't get that one either. And uh, with regulations of charitable bail organizations that have been paying to release criminals without regard for the crimes for which they've been arrested, we thought we should correct that and make that better. And the last thing is we thought making fentanyl thresholds aligned with heroin for purposes of crim criminal penalties should happen. None of those happened. Uh, but that's the nature of uh, divided government. The, the Democrats of the House wanted to go one direction, we wanted to go the other. Those were some things that we did not get that we wanted. Uh, things that we got that we thought were important. I think this is really important. The first one is Matson Strong. That's the one where Eric Matson was, was shot in the line of duty in his head and, and somehow uh, lived uh, to be able to stand up and, and still, still be here. You know, thank God for that. But, uh, so that law basically says if, if you do something like that to a police officer, you can expect a greater penalty. And I was surprised that the other side thought that that was not appropriate. That was absolutely appropriate that we stand up for the police officers that stand in harm's way for us uh, and, and saying there's got to be a stricter, pe stricter penalty, and they agreed. Uh, we have an expansion of violent crime enforcement teams, VSETs, which investigate gang and drug trafficking along with an experimental concept of VSET units specific, specifically for light rail violent crime reduction because we know um, along light rail that it's been a growing problem and people don't feel safe using that. Again, P another one, Peace Officer Standards and Training Board model policy on how to protect and manage confidential informants. That is known as Matthew's Law. That was something that we knew that if people are giving the police information, we need to make sure that they're protected. We all agreed that body cameras for state law enforcement officers at the BCA, Alcohol and Drug Gambling Enforcement, and the Department of Natural Resources was important, and we all agreed that that was something that we should do. 
We agreed to law enforcement training grants of $6 million per year, already funded for tw uh, years 22 and 23. But again, we all agreed on that. We thought that that was a win. Uh, we gave Minnesota state law enforcement salary increases. We thought that was really important for the work that they're doing, that they would have an increase in their salaries. Uh, we, we agreed that current law allows 9-11 operators to refer mental health calls to local social services, and this bill requires a referral and co-response. That's known as Travis Law. We did technical modifications to the Post Board Police Misconduct Database established in 220. Another big one is we agreed to no-knock warrants, that we'd have modifi uh, modification of that so that there is clarity about when those can happen and when those cannot. We had body camera grants for local law enforcement agencies with non-metro prioritization because it, in rural it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, and finally, one time 800,000 appropriation for innovation in community safety grants. Those were all of the things that were in this bill. This bill that's supposed to fund the courts, corrections, and police, those things are in this bill. And so as you look at that bill, you have to say that it was a compromise. You, you don't get everything that you want. And it's, it's, it, this was probably the most difficult public safety bill that I think <laughs> Senator Limmer has ever had to navigate through. And if you think about what's in this bill, plus what we did last July. Last July was the most comprehensive police reform bill that we've ever done in Minnesota. And we said we'd take a look at some more things this year, and we did. Uh, but in the end, it's my expectation that the House will pass the bill. It's been agreed to by leadership, and it's their job to pass this bill on their side, and we need to pass it on our side. A couple last comments. Uh, I mentioned the, the governor was urged to to veto this bill because it includes penalties for those who assault a police officer, um, I, I think we need a clear answer from the governor that that's just not okay. This, that was Matson's bill. That's that piece of the legislation that, look, it's never okay. And so I, he, I, I'm asking for clarity for there. Uh, Matson Strong is a good reason to sign this bill. I can say that both Senator Limmer and myself and the entire Senate Republicans believe that we need to stand up for our, our police officers as they stand in the gap for us. Uh, day in and day out, they stand in the gap. And one of the things that we decided not to do was the, the traffic stops. We didn't want to change anything related to that. And, and think about this. There's millions of traffic stops. Since 2018, there's millions of traffic stops, and we had two tragic deaths as a result of those traffic stops, two. But at the same time, over 900 guns were confiscated in that same period of time. And so if, if it's about making sure our streets are safe, if it's about lowering the crime, which is off the charts, then we gotta let the police do their job and give them the tools to do, do their job. So this is the bill that we've compromised to. We absolutely listened. All those things that I mentioned to you, I will tell you that Three different times I listened to a number of the families that lost loved ones uh, that they felt was related to the police. And that helped shape some of the things that we listened to. And so we're listening, but at the same time, we know that we need to protect uh, the people by protecting the, the police and the, the, the tools that they have. So with that, we can take questions. On that pretextual stops issue, uh, the Posse Caucus today said you didn't hold any hearings on that. You didn't look at that as deeply as you could. Could you both respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Seems like all the time I get to have a, a shared event like this with Gazelka, he gives me the questions. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, Tom, uh, many of the provisions, the policy provisions, were not heard in the Senate. Uh, this during the regular session. That's because traditionally we look at budget years as exactly that. Budget bills should be in budget years. And the policies usually are reserved for later in the second year. But nevertheless, uh, traffic stops developed into more of an issue during the conference committee time. And I believe that Senator G Gazelka uh, addressed it correctly. Uh, there's a lot of good that can happen by traffic stops as well. We have heard the stories that they can be abused, but when you start hearing the news just from the state patrol alone, in a matter of a short period of time, 2018 to present, that over 900 illegal weapons were seized as an example of 
as a consequence of those traffic stops, they do become a valuable instrument for law enforcement. But how do you address the? How do you address the? Um, I mean, part of the traffic stop conversation surrounds this idea that there's just black people are disproportionately pulled over in these sorts of stops and that the, the limits on certain traffic stops, so for, you know, your tail lights out and that's the only reason you're pulling them over to then, you know, search the car for something mm -hmm. else. I mean, is there a way you can bridge that gap to have traffic stops for the reasons that you just mentioned, but also curtail the ones where the black community says you're, we're disproportionately targeted as a result of yeah. this law standing in place. Well, we're very attentive to uh, the comments from the communities of color, uh, especially regarding the potential misuse of law enforcement practice. But nevertheless, usually a total search of a car cannot be justified legally if, in fact, it's just based on a traffic stop. There has to be some compelling reason. Maybe the barrel of a gun is sticking out from under the seat, something like that, which would lead the officer into more of a search. But nevertheless, it's, it's not as open-ended as pulling someone over for a taillight and then doing a total search of a car. There has to be a reasonable suspicion and a probable cause that would justify it. But nevertheless, I want to make sure you realize we are not discounting the stories of the people uh, that come in communities of color. But nevertheless, uh, this will have to we'll have to leave it for another session. How do you define Senator Lemmer? How do you define what is anti-police in your mind? You say you didn't want to well, pass anything that's anti-police. What's anti-police? I think anti-police is during a time when it may put a police officer in danger or uh, a victim further in danger. Uh, oftentimes, it, it compromises the, the collection of evidence. Uh, it all fits under that general heading. I'll add one more, too. Okay. Yeah, one of the big ones I talked about that we were not going to do is, is changing qualified immunity, which basically forces that individual police officer that doesn't have a lot of money to buy their own liability insurance, even if they can get it, and so it basically starts pushing people out of this, this uh, workforce, and we desperately need more police. I know that they're having a hard time hiring more police officers right now. And so we, in addition to talking about what are the reforms we need to do, we need to start having a conversation about how do we get more people to be police officers. And, and I think that's a question that needs to be answered right now. What are some of the items that you thought weren't appropriate to take up in a budget year that you plan to work on next session? Uh, you know, I have been so overwhelmed with this uh, bill, I haven't even thought much about it. Uh, and I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there'll be plenty of, of people reminding me of issues. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, the legislature never goes away. We take a gap in time every six or seven months. We're all back here next winter in January. And uh, there, there is a number of legislators that think that we can do more, and there's always that opportunity to do that. So uh, I'll be making some inroads into uh, communities of color this summer and fall, uh, not only in the Twin City area, but outstate. I want to dig into it myself. I might bring a few other legislators along and uh, dig into it a little bit, pursue uh, issues rather than be fed issues. I think it's important for some legislators, especially in this area that raises so much concern, I think it's important for us to be play the role of a detective and go out and pursue some of these issues and find out what some communities that may be harboring issues deep down but they've never really been asked. I think it's part of our job to do so. Can I ask the caucus say they plan to amend the public safety bill with some of the reforms that they felt didn't make it into the bill? So I'm just curious, what happens if the House sends over a bill that's amended that includes some of the, re the reforms that weren't part of the final deal? Uh, so the question is, what happens if the, the House amends the bills that the, uh, the leadership has agreed to? And keep in mind, the governor, myself, and the speaker have agreed to the, uh, the bill as is. And so uh, my guess is that those would come off. Uh, we would take them off in the Senate for sure. It, it, it was hard enough to get to this agreement. We're right up to the edge. So I'm hoping that that doesn't happen. But uh, 
you know, the jobs bill changed, and we, we have that in conference committee, but we really are running out of daylight. Uh, uh, Representative Mariani, who was you know public safety chair in the House, had said that basically on the Senate side, talking about the negotiations that you know Senator Limmer had said that that you were done negotiating uh, on some of these measures. So I'm just curious if you could sort of you know answer what he said about the, either one. I mean about how those no negotiations played out. I mean were Senate Republicans reluctant to just you know engage any longer no, on some of those things? I think it's that's why I read all the things that we gave up on and then the things that we agreed on together. I think that was important to see the the picture from both sides. Uh, but in the end you have to say look it's over. We, we got to wrap this up. We are all conscious of the fact that whatever we don't get done by July 1, there's no funding. We, and and the, that part would shut down. And so uh, at the leadership level, we reached a point where we just had to push to get to the end. Uh, and this was a more difficult area. Without a doubt, uh, th this one was the toughest public safety bill of the three budget years, uh, two year budget years that I've had to experience. I'm not sure about you, but this was really tough for me. Senator, can you uh, comment on the post board? I, I say senator, but either um, uh, the post board role in this. Both the, the governor's executive, I guess their executive orders today, um, but also the thought by the Posse Caucus that more of these things should go to the post board and that they could adopt some of them by rule. Yeah, one of one of the major provisions that we adopted from the House was the establishment of a collection of data on misconduct of police officers and identifying them so the post board can keep a running total of misconduct. Uh, we agreed with that. Now, there is philosophic difference between having a ultimate, oh, for lack of a better term, internal revenue or, or an internal um, affairs committee from a statewide post on a local police department. Not every police department functions as Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota. Some are very small police departments with one or two officers and somehow uh, a small rural police officer office is not quite the same as handling the issues of a complex metropolitan police department. Um, the philosophic difference is do we let local control govern the management of police departments and let the city councils as well as the uh, mayors uh, oversee the conduct of police officers or do we re rely for uh, a political board established with political appointees do it and we do that often on a variety of different subjects but in this area i think we would rather from our caucus perspective have it governed and held responsible by the local communities regarding local police departments. And about that, uh, no, I just, I was just wondering what about, about the executive this order. executive order? Um, did you know it was coming, and was it? Does it look like it's designed to uh, soften the criticism a bit of what didn't get in the bill? Is this the one issued today? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm not entirely familiar with the total one. I've been in committees all afternoon. Uh, regarding innovation grants, community five innovation day, grants. Five day. I'm going to let you talk yeah. about it. Uh, first of all, the governor's uh, order is only for the state agencies. I think that's important. It's not across the, uh, the entire state. And, and saying that uh, the, the video needs to be released in five days. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will say that uh, the Senate Republicans offered a 30-day ceiling uh, on the when a, when a, the family members could view the, those videos. We just wanted to make sure that the BCA got all of their interview part of it done because it's it's uh, there's a crime that typically has happened, and we want to make sure that there's they get all the data they want. So we actually said 30 days. We were willing to to go there as as a as a direction that we thought was a compromise that was not acceptable. Right now there is no limit, and so we thought that was a good move. But that's governor's prerogative for state agencies, but it does not affect the rest of the state. Can you expand more on the, the rationale behind not allowing families to see you know, the, the body camera within 48 hours or, or five days? I mean, you, you touted the, the use of body cameras and funding them. So 
you know, what is their use but to capture yeah. that incident and you know, for people to review it. So what's the, what's the argument on the, on the timeline, I guess? Yeah, the reason why we wanted a, a timeline is we wanted to make sure that the investigation part of it, the interviews from, from people around the, the scenario, uh, were already talked to before that was released. There's been cases around the, the country where then uh, they saw the, the information and they blurted it out to the public which was in the wrong timing. Uh, at the same time, that was one of the things that I listened to. I, the governor invited me into the cabinet room to talk to some families that went through very difficult situations, and they, did, they didn't get the information for a long, long, long time. And that's why we said, okay, 30 days, you should be able to get all the information you need, and with the flexibility that if interviews weren't done, they still had to be done before it was released. And so that's why. It, it's making sure you get all the facts before it, it becomes public. That it just makes it more difficult to get all the facts. One thing I might add with uh, body cameras, uh, there's no change in existing law that a police chief could, on his own discretion, release uh, body film uh, coverage or footage uh, at any time if he deems it appropriate. All right. Peter, Thank were you, you done with your last question? Okay. <laughs> All right. I was going to have to interrupt a question.